right, hello everybody. Hey everyone, welcome to Thriving Females. I am Sarah. And I am Tara. Um, and we are so excited to be here in August. We know we took a couple weeks off, um, but we've got Lorna Bracewell here with us. And I have the privilege of working with Lorna at Flagler College. But I would love for you to take a little bit of time, introduce yourself. As I was picking some things to put up in your bio, I was like, I had no idea about this. Oh, this is just so fascinating. And I love seeing all your little updates. So tell us about you. Sure. So yeah, I'm an associate professor of humanities at Flagler College. I teach in the political science program and in the women's gender and sexuality studies program. And I guess there's probably more about me, but that's kind of all I know. So say. when you are not teaching at Flagler, what else do you do with your time? Oh gosh. I mean, it's kind of terrible. This is like the terrible thing about being an academic is your work, is your hobby, is your life, can, like all that can blend together. So yeah, I mean, I I, I read and I, I write and I think, and then eventually my butt starts to get sore. So I go and walk my dogs. <laughs> oh my goodness. you. So Lorna, what kind of dogs do you have? Tell everybody, because Tara and I have labs. Well, my, my wife just walked out with them. I would love to like bring them into the- Oh well, wait, so, like, there they are. <laughs> oh, very cute. Your research, oh yeah. Hey, well, so we're, we're good at this stuff. Oh, those are so cute. <laughs> This is Rafferty. He's our he's he's our firstborn male. That's what we call him. Um, <laughs> he's twelve years old. He's a miniature Schnauzer. Um, he is a really sweet dog once you get to know him. But you know, if you have the misfortune of you know knocking on my door like as a UPS delivery person or a postal worker or something like that, um, he does not make a good first impression. Um, very protective um of his domain yeah and then we since i put these up on my website a thousand years ago we got it we got a second dog mikanopi who is also a miniature schnauzer she's just about three and she's the opposite personality she is miss congeniality the only language she speaks is love and um she's never met a stranger so we we have you know, pretty polar opposite uh, dogs. We, we we span the spectrum of miniature schnauzer personalities. <laughs> I had, I know my sister's watching right now and thinking we had a miniature schnauzer Dawkins when we were younger growing up and he was the best little dog. He lived forever and he said, they're good breed. That's what, that's what we're, we're hoping for too with Raph. You know, he's, he's 12. So like he's, he's pushing it there, but so Lorna, like we did our research and then um, before we really dive into some of your really cool projects, we also saw, I said, oh my gosh, Tara, she sings? What? Uh, <laughs> what is this? Like, are you a big time? You had stuff on iTunes and Spotify. I used to. So yeah. Well, <laughs> so yeah, this is when I was, I, my first job out of graduate school was um, in rural Nebraska. I was, I was an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska, Kearney. And um, I'm here performing at um, a March for Science event that some of my students organized. And this uh, young man who, who's playing the violin with me is Caleb Rohr, who's like an extraordinarily talented um, musician and political science student there. And they kind of like cajoled me to, to dust off my, my guitar and, and get up there and provide the entertainment for the March for Science rally. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's probably the last time that I performed live in front of people. And that's, that's been four or five years ago now, uh, maybe six. Now that I think what kind of genre do you, what do you like lean towards? Um, well, I, I used to do the like earnest folk singer songwriter yes. thing, you know, like it was very like nineties, early aughts, like, um, yeah, but I mean, this feels like such a different, a different life. If it's funny, I'll have students who like Google me, right? Um, because that's what we do now, and uh, yeah. they'll come up to me before class and they'll be like, "Dr. Bracewell, did you know that there's a musician with your same name?" And you're like, "I look so different. Like I, I was way more 
well, first of all, I was younger. <laughs> I was like way more feminine presenting back during my, my music career. So they don't even make the connection that it's that it's me. <laughs> so you don't just bust out your guitar and just hang out and start singing songs anymore? I mean, <laughs> for like Christmas, you know, with family, like, you know, that that kind of thing. But I don't I don't even have them out. Actually, we painted we painted the room. And I had them hanging on the wall. But then when we painted the room, I I never put them back out. But. So I guess that scratches you go doing live entertainment right now for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, oh man, I'm so I'm so rusty. It's kind of awful because like when you used to be good at a thing, it's hard to like pick it up again after many years and be not good at it. It's like a terrible <laughs> feeling. So <laughs> I, it's like I feel that way. Like um, I'm 38, so like I'll go and like shoot baskets with my nephew and like I so vividly remember being like 16 years old and like really good at basketball and now I'm like this like decrepit like you know like, oh my gosh I went to David Buster's I, I, with my I daughter look, and, like you know I my knees hurt you know <laughs> yes. oh, this is a terrible mistake I, take the basketball back take it back <laughs> yeah. Tara, I, I know very much I was at Dave and Buster's last week with my daughter and I used to like own that basketball game in the back. And when I went, I was like, oh God, this is embarrassing. Who's looking? Like, yeah, I no. <laughs> That's how I feel when I pick up my guitar. I'm like, man, I, I used to be really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, here, let me just show you on iTunes real quick. <laughs> so tell, um, Lauren, tell us how you got into your field of study, because I think it's very fascinating. Yeah, so I actually, I before I was a professor at Flagler College, I was a student. Mm -hmm. I uh, did my undergraduate degree at Flagler College uh, from 2001 to 2005, and I, I majored in political science. And um, the, the person who is now our vice president of academic affairs at the time was the only political science faculty member. Um, now we we have, you know, three full-time, or four if we still count Art Vandenhouten, <laughs> um, but back then it was just, it, it was an army of one, you know? And, uh, so I, I, fortunately, I really enjoyed Professor Vanden Houten's classes. Um, a lot of the things that he found kind of interesting and fascinating about the world and history, like I also found interesting and fascinating. So it like kind of turned me on to the whole field, but I was doing music. I, one of the reasons I came to Flagler was that St. Augustine is full of bars <laughs> where yeah. I could gigs and I could like, you know, pay for like my life and stuff. <laughs> you know, so when I graduated college, I kind of, I was at a little crossroads. I was fortunate enough that I was successful enough as a musician that I had a lot of opportunities to start touring more and, um, you know, kind of leveling up into that next professional tier as a, as a performer. Um, what I really wanted to do was go to graduate school and study political theory. But I kind of, you know, at 21, you know, thought like, well, I have this opportunity to do this music thing. I'm never going to have the opportunity yeah. to do that again. Graduate school will always be there. So I took um, five or six years and I worked as a professional musician and I enjoyed it. But when I was it was very clear to me when I was done, you know? Um, and so at that point I applied to graduate programs and kind of picked up where I left off. See, you're really putting this a little bit on the down low, you're singing, you're like, I was a professional singer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, did you get to travel all over the United States? Did you go all over the world? What did you do? I did, yeah, I, I, I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of college, campuses, um, you know, student activities, boards and stuff like that would hire me to come and play events. I did a lot of like, you know, smaller performing arts venues, um, kind of black box theater, you know, 300 seat kind of things. Um, I played a lot of bars and coffee shops and folk festivals and women's festivals and, you know, all those um, sorts of things. And yeah, so I mean, I, I went I went all kinds of places. In fact, I even went to Nebraska because uh, when I when I got my job interview at University of Nebraska Kearney, um, 
I was one of the rare candidates for a position there that had actually been to Lincoln, Nebraska one time. And, you know, <laughs> like, you know, so yeah, I performed at that theater and, you know, whatever. And, um, That's awesome. Yeah. And then, and then I got to, I got to tour a lot in, in mostly um, Western Europe. Uh, the furthest east I oh. made it was Czech Republic. So, yeah, I don't know if this is still the case, but back when I was doing it, there was actually like a big audience for kind of Americana music in like Germany and um, Czech Republic and Denmark. And so um, I kind of got hooked in with some people who who booked in that circuit over there. And yeah, I, I got to be this kind of like American curiosity, you know, um, and they all wanted to know where I kept my horses and- Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> we all sets of John Wayne movies. Like we have like, you know, houses and cities. And the stigmatism of what America looks like. We all have barns and horses and- <laughs> Yeah, it was, it, was, it was fun. So yeah, that was when I was like in my early twenties and you know, it, it, it's one of these things like in retrospect, I'm like, oh my God, like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I- lived <laughs> yes. I, was like, I, I was i would never do it now like i'm like i'm 38 but that part of my brain that connects like actions to consequences and can be yeah. like the worst possible outcome like it functions now and i would not stay in some of those musicians apartments that i stayed in when i was <laughs> you know, like they have these like beds of hay above the bar oh my know? gosh <laughs> But it gave you a good perspective on life moving forward to when you became a professor. Do you think so? Yes. Like, I always tell my students, you know, when they're just on the precipice of graduating and they're they're really smart and they're thinking about graduate school, I always say to them, is there anything else you could imagine yourself doing? Anything at all? Because if there is, you should go do that first. It's just like in my case, graduate school will always be there. And a big asset, once you're actually pursuing a PhD or, you know, trying to make your way in academia, a big asset is having some like professional experience and, and skills from like other facets of the universe. Like, so, you know, first of all, like when I got in into my PhD program, you know, I, I had a, I had like a five or six year fellowship and I was getting, you know, $20,000 a year, which was like really generous and fantastic by graduate school standards. But for anybody who's ever had like a grown up job, <laughs> how could you imagine doing that? You know, for me, I, I had been a folk singer. So I'm like, I can go to the dentist, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then like, when it came time to like, go to conferences and network and talk about my my research. I had developed all those skills because I, I had had to market myself and promote myself as a, as a musician. And I cultivated that kind of sense of separation between myself and my work that makes, it gives you a thick skin and makes you more comfortable kind of doing all so anyway I had like developed all those skills without even realizing that's what I was doing and then when I got into graduate school I'm like oh wow like I'm kind of starting out ahead of the pack here because um I, I know how to work a cocktail party or you know like <laughs> if you were a little more worldly about things that were going on. Sure. Sure. And I was just like more able to like be like here's my vision here's my idea do you hate it or do you like it? And if they said they hated it, I would be like, okay, on to the next one. You know, I learned to not take it so personally. Oh, I learned I need that shake. Cause sometimes I'm like, why? Tell me why, I don't get it. <laughs> no, I mean, it's like, you're doing. there's a lot of fish in the sea. <laughs> so Lorna, could you maybe share more about like your, your passion areas in your research and what you've dedicated so much time to? Sure. So I specialize in political theory, which is a kind of subset of political science. Um, political science as a discipline is more like a social science, like a, a sociology or an economics kind of discipline. Um, political theory is this like little corner of the discipline of political science that actually is the oldest part of it. Um, and it 
kind of is more like a humanities kind of oriented uh, subfield where we don't collect data and do statistical analysis. I mean, we could if we wanted to, I suppose. They, they force us to learn how to do those things in graduate school. <laughs> but mostly what we do is we read and interpret texts like, like a historian would do or like somebody in an English department would do. Although we like to think that we read and interpret them in a kind of unique political theorist specific way. Um, so that's the kind of part of political science that I hang out in. And then within political theory, I am a historian of political thought. So I study um, historical texts and ideas um, and the contexts that produced those texts and ideas. And I'm specifically interested in kind of feminist history. So my, my book that came out last year is a revisionist history of the feminist sex wars. And the sex wars were a bunch of debates that happened um, amongst feminists in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s about a whole range of issues like pornography and sex work and BDSM and just a whole, a whole bunch of issues pertaining to sex and sexuality. So um, what I try to do with my research on the sex wars is uh, capture for contemporary audiences the kind of richness and fullness and nuance of those debates because they tend to get kind of flattened when the sex wars are talked about, if they're talked about at all, it's in a really simplistic, reductive way. You know, yeah, here's that book. Oh, there we go. You, yes. got me. you got it going on over there with the I'm trying. <laughs> I always say Tara's my techie person. She is good at this stuff. <laughs> now, is, is that on Amazon, Lorna? Yes, but don't buy it from there unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> Oh, okay. So go to your website and buy it. Or go to the publisher's website or go to okay. your favorite local bookstore, you know, like that. That, that doesn't, you know, <laughs> make workers work so much that they have to piss. Okay. And that is fair. <laughs> That's oh, and That's um, like when Sarah and I were talking about just different guests and stuff like that, you were one that came to my mind so quickly. And it was actually right after you, I guess, presented or spoke at the school board um, or with the city. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Um, and so share some of like the community things that you do, because I didn't get to listen to a whole lot watching it without sound. Like I could feel your passion. <laughs> so what are some of those things that you like, did? <laughs> on that microphone? Like as long as I hold on to this, I will yeah. fly off in a bit of blind rage and passion. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I I wish I would do more of that. Like, I feel like, um, you know, as political scientists, we spend a lot of time, you know, studying um, things like democracy or, you know, theorizing things like citizenship. Um, and we certainly spend a lot of time talking to 18 to 21 year olds about those things. <laughs> um, but we, we, we should, I think, spend more time than we do actually like practicing those things. Um, so I, I kind of wish I, I did more of it, but I do, I do try to be engaged um, as a, as a citizen in politics when I think it's important. And when I think that my, my voice, my personal experience or my scholarly expertise can, can make a difference. And, um, so lately, I don't know, you know, how closely folks have been following. This is happening at local school boards all across the country, but it's also happening here in, in Duval County and in St. John's County. There's been these, um, you know, groups of, um, you know, I guess like concerned parents is how they posture um, and present themselves who have been trying to do things like in Duval County, um, get the county to like retract its uh, LGBTQ support guide that it had worked over the course of many months with a wide range of experts and stakeholders in the community to put together, I think it was like a 19 page or something guidebook to um, help teachers and staff at schools better support LGBTQ plus students who are struggling with all kinds of issues, right? Bullying, they're struggling with homelessness because of parental rejection. Um, they're, they're struggling with 
you know, um, anxiety and a lot of like self identity and internal things, depression, suicidal ideation. I mean, there's all kinds of data that shows that, you know, these um, many of these issues are much more prevalent amongst LGBTQ young people because of the like oppression that they experience. So anyway, Duval County had done right by these kids and put together this really great um, kind of state of the art support guide and these these parent these parent groups um, who do not speak for all parents um, but claim to speak for all parents <laughs> to, to pressure the the school board to like retract or rescind this guidance and you know, so I knew I went to that meeting and it was like it was all over the news because it turned out like I wasn't the only one who went to that meeting there were like 300 people I think who filled out public comment cards to speak at that meeting and it ended up running. I want to say like eight hours, um, and I I I I stayed for most of it, but I did not stay for all of it. I I got my turn to speak at probably like eleven o'clock at night. Do you feel, Lorna? I know I have a lot of teacher friends in St. John's County, but I also have a librarian who believes everything should stay. She's very passionate. She wants right, to leave. The other issue is banning books, right? So they they there's there's a kind of you know list of of books that these you know, parents have singled out because they think it's, you know, pornographic or they think it, you know, has like critical race theory in it or something like that. So God forbid we talk about actual things. <laughs> yeah. That really happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, you know, they're trying to pressure, kind of bully, frankly, um, school boards into, you know, removing these books from libraries. So anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You were talking about your friend who's a librarian. No, she's a librarian and she there she does a lot of the support groups, but she also does um she is very she's almost on the end of her retiring and she posted the other day that she's very frustrated, you know, they're taking certain groups away or wanting them to be taking certain groups away, but they're also trying to take, you know, books away from kids. I even have, you know, kindergarten first grade teachers that are like there's some really good books out there that you know for families that have two moms or two dads they want to take those out and they they want to keep them in there they said it's so important because it teaches us kindness it teaches there's more than one way to have families and i feel like every teacher i talk to they they struggle with this controversy from i feel like it's a small group of parents do you or do you think it's a lot um I mean, I think it's it's a small group, but it's very organized. It's very vocal. It's very well funded. Um, so they're able to exert a disproportionate amount of influence, which is why I that's why I thought it was worth my time to go out and and speak up because um, there is not a kind of comparable organized grassroots net, network of parents on the other side of these issues. I mean, there, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of people with children in public schools who, you know, don't feel well represented by a group like say Moms for Liberty, um, but they are, in my experience, reluctant or just not organized, not, not galvanized, not mobilized, right? Um, around these issues, I wish, I wish that they were. Um, so anyway, you know, as I, I'm, I am not a parent, I, I am a licensed foster parent in St. John's County, but we don't currently have a placement. I, I don't didn't know that. Yeah. I, I don't have a, a kid in, in St. John's County public schools. And my, my wife used to work for Duval County public schools. Um, you know, so I don't really have, um, you know, a, a dog in the fight in that sense, but I am, uh, an LGBTQ person. I teach at the college level courses on LGBTQ politics and LGBTQ history. Um, you know, and and I I know some stuff about like the history of similar efforts in the state of Florida to um, you know suppress public discussion of diverse sexualities and and genders. And you know I. I I don't want to bore people, but you know there was like a there was a whole committee in the state legislature in the 1960s, the Johns Committee, that was formed first to go after um, activists involved with the NAACP and to investigate them for links to communist organizations. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and they had subpoena power. I mean, they, this was a this was it was a state legislative committee, you know, operating with the full 
authority of, of the Florida state government. It turns out the NAACP by that point was really well organized and lawyered up. And um, the Johns Committee didn't have much success there. But in the 1960s, the LGBTQ community was not organized and was not in a, in a position to, to push back. Um, and so the Johns Committee went after um, LGBTQ teachers in Florida's K through 12 schools and colleges and universities and even students with like great zeal. And they would they would they would issue subpoenas. They would pull, you know, kids at UF out of out of lectures, you know, lecture halls filled with hundreds of people. They'd have uniformed police officers come in and pull these kids who were suspected of homosexuality out of class. They'd take them, you know, without any, you know, legal representation or anything. They they take them to interrogation rooms and they'd say, you know, so-and-so told us that, you know, you're involved in this homosexual network. And if you don't name names, you know, we're going to let your family know, we're going to let, um, you know, your boss at work know. And at this time, sodomy was a criminal offense in Florida, because this is, this was before Lawrence v. Texas, um, the Supreme Court decision that ruled laws criminalizing uh, gay sex unconstitutional. This was before all that. That wasn't until the early 2000s. Um, so anyway, you know, you were facing potential criminal charges. You could lose, if you were a professor at UF, you could lose tenure because um, homosexual conduct was, you know, considered a, a violation of the kind of standards necessary for the maintenance of tenure. So they had, um, you know, real leverage over a lot of people and they, people committed suicide out of you know, fear, you know, um, deliberately instilled in the community by the Johns Committee. So it was a real dark time in Florida history. So, you know, I, I'm like, I'm a scholar who studies this stuff. And so I try to go to these public meetings and put into context that longer historical context, some of what we see happening right now in, in the 21st century. So Lorna, based on like those horrific stories back then, what they you know, everybody had to go through or endure and moving forward. I feel like, is it just me? And this could be my personal opinion. I feel like we've moved forward so well and lately we've been moving backwards. Yeah. Yeah, this is something I think a lot about. Um, I think I'm to the point where I'm just like, I'm allergic <laughs> to, to narratives of progress. Like, I, I feel I feel silly saying it because like, you know, here I am, like, you know, when I was a student at Flagler, Gavin Newsom was the mayor of San Francisco and he was making headlines because he was, you know, issuing marriage license licenses to same sex couples. And, you know, one of the first you know, mayors to do that. And, um, you know, same sex marriage was kind of a pipe dream. And, and now here I am uh, a number of years later that I don't want to count. Uh, and I'm like gay married. So like there have there have been changes. Yeah. That have been positive. But you know, I'm I'm still just so reluctant to to think in terms of like progress. Cause I think it like it tempts us to to rest on our laurels. Um uh -huh. and and to, to kind of think of these struggles for for civil rights and for kind of full democratic citizenship as like one-off things when in fact I think they're like they're the work of generations and you're, you're never done it, it's kind of like owning a house yeah it, my wife and I bought a house like three years ago one thing I've learned is like your house is never like no no never no. right Cause it's like, like, it looks great. And then two months later, you're like, but that doesn't. Yeah, you get the roof fixed. And then the next month you're buying a new air conditioner and you get the air conditioner fixed and then the sprinkler pump isn't working. You know, like, it's like, and yeah. I think that, like democracy is that way. Like it's, you're never done. You know, you're so, just you kind of carry the torch for your time and then you pass it to the next. Lorna, one of the things I love about these interview series that Sarah's coordinating is like so many different perspectives and so many different types of audience members. And I love when audience members, you know, ask different questions and different topics and stuff. And, um, you know, you come from the college world and you you spoke at, 
you know, school board, you know, city things. But um, one of our audience members has asked, you know, what what is your opinion on schools having these types of conversations uh, with elementary school students? And so, you know, again, I know it's it's your opinion, it's your take. It's everybody's just kind of an open discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think like it's good. Like, I think that like it's good that queer people exist in the world. Like the existence of queer people is like a positive good that we should actively cultivate. Um, and that doesn't mean, right, that I'm a groomer, which I have been called to my face numerous times at these school board meetings. I am not promoting, right, um, a kind of inappropriate sexualization of children, right? Um, what I am promoting is like, cultivating a sensibility in people of all generations that queerness, which is not just a sex thing, right? Uh -huh. That queerness is like a positive good in the world, right? Um, our differences on a whole range of axes is what makes like living in the world worthwhile. Um, and I think that queer people, and I mean that in like the most expansive of senses, right? When I when I say queer people, I mean, um, like I mean literally, like the etymology of the word queer. It it means kind of, you know, it's it's kind of like like twisted. Um, like if you think of a, there's a British expression, queer the pitch, right? It's it's like it's like a scance, um, and I think that people that are like a scance that like kind of don't fit into the world in the way that the world currently exists are like a good thing because yeah. they can actually like shift the contours of the world, right, um, and make it a richer, broader, more fully human place. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's like vitally important, you know, and like I had to, I have nieces and nephews and I had to explain to them kind of like, what's the deal with Aunt Lorna? Because Aunt Lorna looks like a boy, right? And, you know, my my nephew, kids are like very obsessed when they're like in first grade with like gender. Like it's, <laughs> it's actually quite weird. Like, and I, I'm like literally the program coordinator for a gender studies program. I'm not as I'm not as obsessed with gender as like <laughs> as a first um, But yeah, I mean like my cut or my nephew, he was just like he's like you look you look like a boy. Aren't you just a boy? And I'm like, no, no, dude. <laughs> like, I don't I don't know what to tell you, man. And he's like, but but you're not a girl, right? And I'm like, I don't know, man. Like I guess sort of but no, i see where you're coming from with that right <laughs> like, but i love that you created this comfort zone for a first grader to to ask yeah, and then yeah. that you had that conversation and it, they do i mean kids yeah kids are queer like talk about a scance a skew like not fitting i mean that's kids you know and then they're, they're constantly you know making adults uncomfortable <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> know how to be right, and which is what I love about them so much. It's like, please never learn how to be. Um, and so anyway, you know, these conversations, as long as queer people exist in the world and interface with children, which we will, because many of us have children, many of us started out as children. <laughs> um, then it's it's vital, not only is it appropriate, it is vitally important um, to talk about queer existence with kids. And just like anything with kids, you've got to talk about it with them in like a kid way, you know? Um, but don't you think- are use the word etymology, because I need you to make that a kid definition for me. <laughs> oh, etymology, it just, <laughs> the kind of, um, if you trace back in language the root of a word like queer, that's etymologists are the people who do that tracing back in in history um, to get us at like the kind of like origin of a of a particular word. My Lorna, don't you think that, that um, 
I always feel like sometimes we as adults, we can ruin the younger generation of their innocence. I mean, you know, they probably, your your nephew probably was like, okay, cool, whatever, after you explained it, moved on. It's the same with racism or being queer. Okay, got it. But they don't see that. I feel like us as adults, we don't do good by, you know, not letting them see that. Because I, I don't think if we, I still think that's there because it's a, it's a learned behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And like, if we're not talking to them about it, that doesn't mean they're going to like stop seeking out information about it or learning about it. And that's frankly, like, that's, that's the problem. So like, if you look at statistics on, you know, rates of bullying, which I mentioned briefly earlier, you know, LGBTQ kids, especially trans kids, they are like disproportionately subjected to bullying, taunting, physical, physical bullying, threats with, weapons on school property, you know, the, the CDC tracks all this stuff nationally and LGBT kids are like the most likely kids to experience this kind of violence and this kind of aggression at schools. And the reason is that it's not, the reason isn't that kids don't learn anything about gay people. It's that what kids learn about gay people is that they're disgusting monsters who are uh, justifiable targets of this kind of violence and this kind of verbal aggression. That's what they learn in the mm -hmm. absence, you know, of, of people like me uh, talking with my nephew. That's the only exposure that he has to, you know, conversations about sexual orientation and gender identity. And, you know, so I think that like, we have to go in there and counter those you know, oppressive narratives about LGBT people with the truth, which is that like LGBT people are just like all the other people. Like we suck. We suck just like all the other people. <laughs> we like disappoint you and manipulate you and lie to you and mistreat you just like all the other people, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Man, I don't know if you're looking at some of the questions and stuff. I love when people feel comfortable to ask questions and everything, but I feel like you just answered it is I think a lot of people are like, just how do we have these discussions? It doesn't necessarily need to be just with kids. It doesn't need to be just with college students or, you know, things like that. But these tough topics, like all of that, how, how, how do we have these discussions? Like you just put it out on the table. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just, just tell them the truth. I mean, don't tell them stuff that like is, don't burden them with stuff that they don't need to know, right? They'll get there. Um, but you know, like I could, I could tell my nephew, like, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a boy and I'm a little bit of a girl and I'm not like other girls that you were probably going to meet, you know, but there are some other girls that you'll meet that are going to be like me. Um, and he like kind of gets that, you know, I don't know now, now he's like 14. So I got him. <laughs> he doesn't talk to me anymore. He just stares at his, shoes and you know so Lorna then I go back to so don't you think like I had trouble with the whole taking the books out of the school because they didn't want their kids but to learn stuff but I'm pretty sure 99.9% .9 of the the kids have phones and they <laughs> they see way more on there than yes. ever some of these books oh god yeah I mean the internet yes um yeah so to think that you know, and that seems to be the kind of fantasy, you know, and I'm, I'm just basing this off of what I hear um, some of these folks say in public comment at school board meetings that, I, that I've attended. You know, the, the kind of fantasy is that like a world where queerness doesn't exist, where it's like totally stamped out from existence. And like, first of all, like, I think that is like a genocidal fantasy um, that is impossible to achieve and monstrous morally monstrous. Um, second of all, like, good luck with that. It's impractical. <laughs> like, you know, like, um, yeah. So, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe you can win a kind of skirmish here and there and, and keep a book out of a school and do like a tremendous amount of needless, useless harm in the process. But your kids are gonna, they're gonna, I know. they're gonna see a drag queen. Yes. Oh my God. They're good. And we just saw one this week. When did we see it, Tara? We went to Drag Queen Show the other day. We went last weekend. Tara is Drag Queen obsessed. That's where we had to go for her birthday. 
Sorry, they are just beautiful and amazing, like performers, and I love the way they live their life. And I yeah, they, I, if you watch Looney Tunes, like Bugs Bunny did drag, like <laughs> you know, like it's it's like I don't know. I mean, I don't I, know. We were all jealous of their butts. We're like, look at their butts, They're perfect. <laughs> they're, they're pretty amazing. I always say, like you know, the reason I'm a butch instead of a femme is I'm lazy. <laughs> At least you're honest. I don't want to work that hard. Like it's a lot of like what does Dolly Parton always say? Like it costs a lot of money to look this cheap. Like <laughs> it takes a lot of work to look that good. And like I'm just, you know, happy to put on a flannel and oh well, Lorna, I love this question that we got from somebody. Um Bailey oh. asked, how can we become oh. An ally, like what? That's my niece. I'm very proud of her for asking that. <laughs> Hi, Bailey. Uh, yeah, no. So, you know, I I gave one example earlier. You know, like pay attention to what's happening in your local politics, especially right now, because there is like a highly motivated, flush with with funds and kind of mainstream political support grassroots movement that is really targeting LGBTQ plus people, like in in like an unprecedented way. Like it's, it's the worst, like I said, like, you know, I get, I get doxxed on the internet and I get threats and I speak mm -hmm. at public events and, you know, my, my bosses get emails, you know, trying to get me fired. I mean, it's like, it's, it's bananas. Um, I can't believe that this is the world we're living in. Uh, so we need people to be like outspoken about like denouncing this this bad behavior <laughs> you know um and I know that it can be scary like you know speaking at a school board meeting like I was joking about how tightly I was holding that microphone and I was a professional entertainer for like years and years and years so I mean I I, I public I do public speaking for a living but I was still very nervous so I, I I respect and understand that it's not an easy thing to do but it is so important that our elected officials hear from those of us who, you know, Moms for Liberty or whatever does not do not speak for, right? And you don't you don't have to, you know, say anything particularly profound. Lord knows I don't when I go to these things. You know, the, the point of it is for these elected officials to hear from their constituents and stakeholders what their views are. You know, so even if all you do is say, I don't, I don't support removing these books from the school or, you know, I support maintaining the LGBTQ plus support guide as it is, or I support, you know, the, the school doing everything it can to, to prevent bullying of LGBTQ students. Even if that's all you say, that matters. That that really does make a difference. So Lorna, my um, sister and my nieces were at um, uh, their state capital and when the Roe versus Wade thing and this elderly lady, I said, oh, I wanna get you on Thriving Females, but it was kind of chaotic, but they they got to talk to her and she was one of the originals, you know, back then speaking out. And now yeah. fast forward, she, she said, I'm not, you just don't stop. She says, yeah. I'm back here again, and I'm going to continue to fight with for what I believe in. And yeah. she said, that was this thing that was sad, you know, that here I am doing it again, but I won't stop. Yeah. Oh, look at this fun comment from Mike. Support hearing all sides of an issue. It broadens our minds and hopefully increases understanding. And so, again, it's, you know, wherever, wherever we stand, just being open to hearing those things. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say, like, on that kind of theme, the hardest part of going to those meetings for me as an LGBTQ person is hearing the, just the virulently hateful, awful things that yeah. are said about me and my people, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, that I, that's a side I would, <laughs> I wish I didn't hear. <laughs> and see, I go back to Lorna, what you just said. We, we suck or we do stupid things, we're normal. Why are they saying ugly things about you? You're no different than a black person, an Asian person, a straight person. You know what I mean? It's like, we're all the same. And it's mm -hmm. like, I, it, that just, it's, you know, people of color say the same thing. Why are we hearing ugly things? And I, that just blows me out my mind in 2022. Yeah. I get a little crazy about it sometimes. <laughs> I really, I mean, I've, this whole living through this time, it's part of it's COVID. Some of my mom is, my mom is sick and some of it's that like, but I, 
I've really, uh, I've had to like draw on, you know, resources in a faith tradition in a way that I never had mm -hmm. to in other parts of my life, because it is so hard for me to like maintain like a spirit of compassion toward, toward some of those, some of those people at those meetings. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I insist on doing it because like, I will not let, they can say whatever they want to say to me, but I will not, you know, let them, uh, I guess like, like pervert my spirit or like blacken my spirit. That's the kind of language. You Even know? though you want to bop them on the head with the microphone. <laughs> like, I will not say what I, <laughs> what my more self, you know. Um, no, but I, I, I hate that. I hate, I hate that darkness that I can, you know, kind of feel that that's what they're trying to draw out in, mm -hmm. in not me and all of us. And, you know, um, I forget why I even went on this tangent, but yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's good. I think it's good to have. Um, I love that you go to school board meetings and you don't have kids there. People don't realize the importance of that because you, you believe in that. And that's, you know. Oh, yes. Like a thousand times. Now I get that it can be awkward. Like, cause if you are yourself a parent with a kid in the local public school, that gives you a kind of authority. Um, you know, but that's not that's not the only claim to authority that that you have in that context, right? The purpose of public schools, believe it or not, <laughs> is a public good. Mm -hmm. It's not just a private, personal, individual good. It certainly is that, right? Education is individually transformative. Um, it is soul craft. You know, I will use that language. Um, so there's definitely like a kind of individual uh, dimension to a public school and to education. It all schools also provide a kind of private good to individual families. I mean, it's basically like the only publicly subsidized childcare that we have in this country. Right? <laughs> um, so, so I get it. Like I get that parents have this kind of personal investment. Um, in, in schools because they're children, but the, the point of schools, like the, the highest function of a school is not that personal private stuff. It's, it's the public good of preparing children for free lives as democratic citizens. Like yeah. that's the point, right? And yeah, we get some job skills and yada, yada, yada. And like, there's other stuff and there's, you know, social emotional learning. I don't mean to like discount any of that because like that's also part of what schools do. But like the reason that the government taxes us to have them, like go read John Adams, you know, this is, this is not critical race theory. This is John Adams thoughts on government, you know, um, <laughs> the that public schools are important and that we, that we ultimately have them is, is this kind of public good of it, preparing individuals for the, the burdens and responsibilities of democratic citizenship, because you can't have a democracy if you don't have citizens with the wherewithal to deliberate and make decisions together as a, a public body. So we all have a stake, whether we're parents or not, whether our kids are, you know, aged out of the K through 12 schools in our district or not, whether we're teachers or not, we all as citizens have a stake in what goes on in these schools. And so, yeah, I hope that people feel like empowered to, to go there and, and make their preferences and their views and their opinions and their priorities known. Wow. Well, Lorna, this has been such an exciting so good. Like, so discussion. Good. I, I may need to tap into how I can audit a class or two. <laughs> Oh yes. You're, you're, you can teach me more like vocabulary words so I can um, use them. Um, I don't mean to and I hate like this is like getting a PhD breaks you because like I don't mean to not talk like a person. Like this is just how I talk. I'm not trying to put on airs. No, or... no, I no, but that's relatable. That's, I loved it. <laughs> that's relatable. Yes. Yes. No, that's absolutely I never want to be like throwing in jargon that obscures more than it illuminates or no no i just it just no, rolls off nice. your tongue and i was like one day i'm gonna get there 
<laughs> We're going to be cool like you, Lorna. Yes. <laughs> you said be cool like yourselves. You're doing <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sarah. I know we've got our next interview Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. You want to share who our guest is going to be? Um, and I don't. Um, it's Kimberly DeMaria. She has got her story. Um, addiction had affected her life. She was a nurse for 25 years. But she um, created the Soul Addiction um, Journey website, and she's got a lot to talk about because being a nurse and then having addiction hit her in her life, um, a different perspective and what she's doing out there. Um, one of her thing is uh, not letting people judge her, judge them for being an addict of any sort. Don't, you know, and I think that's great because some people are like, oh, you were drugs, you did alcohol. Yeah. And I, I saw that, you, you know. You are the worst thing you ever did. <laughs> what? Yeah, people people want to say that you are the worst thing you ever did. Yeah, and I know her goal is to yeah. really not have people judge people because they're an addict instead of lift them up and support them, you know. And mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of the reason Lauren and I was so happy you decided to do this because we try to get all perspectives on here, but we try to stay, I mean, we're probably a little biased at times, but we try to stay on the kindness, preaching it um, and feeding knowledge out there because I believe everybody deserves a spotlight for things that they do in the community or what they're doing in life. Um, we interviewed somebody in um, United Kingdom and she like inspired all of us. And she was like a little thing she said, we were like, oh my gosh, oh my God. I mean, I felt like I should walk out like, <laughs> So it's just really fun to be able to put the spotlight on things that you're doing. And I'm going to totally check out your songs. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it was well, so fun having you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I have to tell you, um, when you first, Tara first reached out to me to invite me onto uh, Thriving Females, I, I told my wife, I'm like, hey, hey, babe, should I do this? She's like, oh, <laughs> And I was like, because I'm neither thriving nor exactly female. <laughs> I was like, maybe if there was like a like languishing queers, you know. <laughs> you know. It's going to be the future subset of thriving females. Yes. But I think you've taken a female in a different context and you're thriving doing that. So there's oh, yeah. so much I'm, to it. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. You're oh, amazing. No, again, I just, the, the, the passion and what you inspire in our students you know, I, I, I would call you a thriving individual and a very Absolutely. impactful individual. Um, and so I was excited and honored that you said yes. Um, yes. Very yeah. excited. Thank you so much, Lorna. Thank yes. You. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And we'll see you Thursday night. All right. Bye. Bye.